about. Oh, Gloss would probably be the one that you're least likely to have heard of, but I'm wrong, and that's interesting. Uh, some of you must come and tell me afterwards so in what connection you know about him. Um, right. Well, to go back to the theme of, our, of the first lecture which I gave, Bloch is really our first Marxist modernist. Um, he wasn't a member, he was a member of the Frankfurt School, although he was friendly with all the major members of the Frankfurt School. But like the other members of the Frankfurt School who will be going on to discuss, Bloch was an artist as well as a Marxist, a philosopher, and a social theorist. He was, concerned, he was as concerned to develop revolutionary art as to develop revolutionary theory. His critique of society was the foundation of the principles of innovation in his art. And vice versa, his experiments in artistic style structured the presentation of his social theory. You may remember that in the first lecture I said it was this tradition that made the Frankfurt School interesting in the structure of the MEM course. Bloch was a writer and a musician. He was closely involved with the expressionist movements in Germany before, during, and after the First World War. It has been said that the book that he published in 1918, when he first became known, which was called The Spirit of Utopia, was the first work of expressionist social theory. You may remember we discussed expressionism a bit last week. I hope uh, you remember some of the things we said about it. If you don't, I'll repeat them later on. He was also, Brock was one of those, and we, dis we discussed this a bit last week as well, who was very excited by Lukács' history and class consciousness, especially the analysis of verification in that book and the possibility the theory of verification offered for analysing new forms of domination, cultural as well as political and economic. But Bloch, Bloch was also one of those who used Nietzsche's ideas in a critique of, of modern culture and in the development of a new concept of subjectivity. You remember the first lecture I said that the, the Frankfurt School were influenced by Marx, Nietzsche and Freud, and this is particularly true of Bloch. Like Freud, he was interested as well in the parapraxies of everyday life. That is, well I'll go on to later to tell you what I mean by that. But he considered that everyday life was the clue to the formation of subjectivity and its possibilities. But, as I intimated last week, Bloch rejected Lukács' philosophy of history, he rejected Lukács' analysis of fascism, and above all, for our interests, he rejected Lukács' rejection of expressionism. Lukács' designation of expressionism and modernism in art as reactionary and decadent. And um, in the second half of this lecture, I'm going to be comparing Lukács and Bloch on these issues. In short, Bloch was one of those who found Lukács' early work liberating and his later work deadening. In fact, Bloch used Lukács' early ideas more consistently than Lukács himself in his understanding of the relationship between art and society. Well, who was Ernst Bloch? I'll just give you a few details of his life, because like all of these people, he was involved in escaping fascism and Stalinism and um, um, lived in many different countries. And I'll tell you what his major works were. He was born in 1885 in Germany, and like Lukács, who in fact met at, um, at university, he studied at Berlin and Heidelberg, where he met not only Lukács, but also the sociologists, Wimmel and Weber. He was part of those circles. As I said, in 1918, he wrote his first major book called Spirit of Utopia, which was largely on music. In, in 1914 to 1918, he was one of the very few Germans who was opposed from the beginning to the First World War and he went into exile in Switzerland, and that was where he met Walter Benjamin, who was also in exile during that period in Switzerland. But after the First World War, he went back to Germany, and he was very active and involved in the revolutionary movements which broke out at that period. That was between 1918 and 1923. In 1921, during this revolutionary period, he wrote another book which subsequently became very well known, called Thomas Münzer, Theologian of the Revolution. And in fact, of course, that's a very good description of Bloch. 
1924 onwards, when it was obvious that the revolutionary movements in Germany had been defeated, Bloch was one of the first people in Germany who understood the threat of, Na of the rise of the Nazi party. And from 1924 onwards, he was trying to warn people about this. From 1933 to 1938, um, Bloch, like all the other members of the Frankfurt School, uh, had to leave Germany, and he lived in Prague, Vienna, and Paris. In 1935, he published a very important book from our point of view, which was called The Heritage of Our Time. It was a major anti lukacs work in which he defended expressionism and analyzed fascism. He also published other articles during this period against Lukacs, um, which appeared in popular front journals. From that, in 1938, um, like everybody else except Lukacs, he went to America. And in, in America, he wrote what is known as his major work, which is being translated into English at the moment, which is called as Principe Hoffman, that means the principle of hope. It's three gigantic volumes. Um, during this period in America, he was very close to Thomas Mann and Bertolt Brecht. And with Mann and Brecht, he edited an emigre journal. Bloch was one of those who, like Brecht, after the war in 1949, went back to East Germany, not West Germany. He was a professor at Leipzig University. But in 1961, he left East Germany and went to West Germany. And he stayed in West Germany at Tübingen University until he died. And that was the summer before last, 1977, summer 1977. So that's a, a very... Uh, sketch of his life. Now, um, as I found out, some of you have already heard of Bloch. I don't know in what connection, but in fact, Bloch, until very recently, has been best known in Germany, well, perhaps not in Germany, but certainly in America, because of the enormous influence he has had on modern theology, on modern radical theology. Bloch is one of the few Marxist thinkers who is also deeply read in both Jewish and Christian theology and in Jewish and Christian mysticism. Jürgen Moltmann, the famous theologian, wrote a book inspired by Bloch called The Theology of Hope, and that's one of the works that has disseminated his influence. Well, what's the connection between Marxism and theology? Let me just say in the first instance that Bloch, like Marx, believed that all criticism begins with a criticism of religion. But unlike Marx, Bloch didn't believe that religion is only the upholding and masking of the status quo, only the opium of the people. Bloch, Bloch believed that religions also, religion and therefore ideology in general, can also function as what he called expressive forms of protest. So he didn't really see religion as legitimating the existing society, he thought religious movements could also be movements of revolt and protest. He was particularly interested in Christian eschatology. That means, well, it, it doesn't mean it generally, but for Bloch that meant, um, he was interested in Christianity as a hope for ultimate things, for what does not yet exist as the motor of history. That sounds rather cryptic, I'll be coming back to it. But this notion of the not yet, the noch nicht, is very important to Bloch. So that's one of the reasons why Bloch has become well known, because he's one of the few Marxists who have been interested in religion. Now, another preliminary question which we should ask ourselves is, in what sense is Bloch's writing his social theory expressionist or modernist? Why do we call Bloch an expressionist social theorist or Marxist? Well, his early work, and it's true of his later work as well, but particularly his first book, Spirit of Utopia, had several features about it which Bloch had self-consciously taken over from expressionism. In the first place, the form and style of his work. Bloch, when he wrote, tended to juxtapose deliberately elements of very different traditions. And this is a feature of expressionist art, too. He would juxtapose Christianity and Marxism, mysticism and social theory, in order to bring both or all of these things into critical focus. And by use of quotation and pastiche, he tried to illuminate suppressed assumptions and raise new questions. <coughs> 
The second feature of his work, which was associated with expressionism, was his apocalyptic theory of history. And we'll be coming back to this when we contrast him with Lukács. But for the moment, I will just say that Bloch rejected an evolutionary theory of history. Instead, the present became for him the now, with a capital N. That is an absolute moment to be analyzed for the ingredients of the not yet, the ideal future. As I say, I'll come back to that. But this apocalyptic theory of history was also associated very much with expressionist works of art. You may remember I mentioned that last week when I gave you a brief introduction to expressionism. The third aspect of Bloch's social theory, which was, uh, had a lot in common with express expressionism, was his emphasis on the formation and importance of subjectivity on all aspects of subjectivity, including those aspects not considered before by either philosophy or Marxism, that is, daily life, sexuality, reactionary as well as progressive political positions. Now, all these interests of Bloch were initially unified by his interest in the possibility of communist revolution in Germany. In fact, Bloch at this period around the end of the First World War and the period of, of revolution in Germany has been called the German philosopher of the October Revolution. Now I'll tell you what that phrase means, the German philosopher of the October Revolution. Marx said that Germany, it was Germany, that is Kant and Hegel, who provided the theory of the French Revolution as a compensation for the fact that the French Revolution didn't occur in Germany. That is, there was no national liberal bourgeois revolution in Germany. Instead, Marx said, the Germans spent all their time providing the theory and understanding of the revolution which occurred in France. Similarly, after World War I, the Ger German Revolution failed, but the Russian one succeeded. And um, this catchphrase of uh, describing Bloch is saying that Bloch provided a theory um, of the revolution which occurred in Russia and analyzed why it didn't occur in Germany. In fact, it's quite true. From 1918 onwards, Bloch analyzed the possibility and failure of the revolution in Germany, and from 1924 onwards, he analyzed the success of the reactionary revolution of fascism. Now, I want to say something about Luc uh, Bloch, what Bloch took from Lukács and where he disagreed with Lukács. Bloch was a very close friend of Lukács's at the time at which Lukács was writing history and class consciousness. That's between 1918 and 1923. In fact, he later said wickedly that he'd written all the good bits himself. But in the 1930s, he became Lukács's main protagonist in the debate over art and the rise of fascism. He became Lukács' bitterest enemy. So, we want to know what happened, why he changed his relationship with Lukács. Well, we had some discussion already of the way in which Lukács changed his own position between these two periods. What was Bloch excited by in history and class consciousness? He was excited by some of those aspects which we discussed last week. He was excited by the analysis of reification, by Lukács' stress on the concept of totality, um, in the sense that Lukács emphasized totality in relationship to the loss of the old pre-capitalist one, and in relationship to the possibility of recapturing the totality as a historical ideal. He was impressed by Lukács' analysis of fragmentation in modern life, due to the technical changes in the division of labor. He was interested in Lukács' emphasis on the everyday experience of new forms of domination. But he did not accept the role that Lukács gave in the second half of history and class consciousness to the party as the educator of the proletariat. You may remember last week we discussed the distinction that Lukács makes between existing and ideal class consciousness or imputed class consciousness, which is what Lukács called it. Um, and in fact, although we didn't discuss it last week, in the second half of history in class consciousness, Lukács gives a central role to the Communist Party as the means by which the transition will be made 
from existing class consciousness to imputed or ideal class consciousness. And it was this part of his analysis which Bloch was most seriously opposed to, and so were the rest of the Frankfurt School. Um, since he rejected this idea of the party as the educator of the proletariat, he also rejected the Lukács' theory of history on which that role of the party is based. He believed that Lukács had reduced history to a single dimension with a linear structure, that is, the proletariat's path from rarefied to imputed or ideal class consciousness with the party as its guide. Instead of this gradualist theory, in which rarefication is progressively overcome, Bloch draws the equally logical conclusion that rarefication will have to be exploded. There's no guarantee that it will melt away. He emphasizes, this is Bloch now, the present or the now as having the utopian possibilities within it. Unlike Lukács, he does not project the ideal society into the historical future. He stresses instead the moment of decision, that revolution is a qualitative leap, not a gradual or guided achievement. Existing class consciousness, according to Bloch, is not working towards ideal class consciousness, but already possesses it in suppressed forms in art, in fantasies, in ideologies. But Bloch's view is not voluntaristic. He's not saying that revolution simply depends on an act of will. His view is in fact based on a historical account of the present, which stresses, which does not stress the present as a culmination of the past or as a superseding of the past, but instead stresses the various ways in which the different pasts still live in the present and may be realized within it. I'll come back to that. Bloch substitutes his own notion of the sphere of the present in place of Lukács' notion of the totality of history. You may remember we discussed Lukács' notion of totality last week and the different things that it meant to Lukács. Luk uh, sorry, Bloch's notion of the sphere emphasizes the structure rather than the process. He called it, he called the sphere, quote, the expression of different subject-object levels in the process itself. <coughs> we discussed this distinction between subject and object last week, but by subject-object levels, Bloch meant that at any point in time, there are many different classes in a society, each with their class consciousness at different stages from the actual to the ideal. That's Lukács' distinction again. Therefore, he differed from Lukács in believing that for a successful revolution, it's necessary to transform all classes, not just the proletariat. And secondly, he believed that actual, as opposed to ideal class consciousness, must not be considered as merely false consciousness or delusion, as many Marxists tended to do. He quoted Lukács against himself against Lukács. Lukács said, we must discover the practical significance of these different relations between the economic totality, imputed class consciousness, and the real psychological thoughts of men and their lives. And Bloch said that Lukács didn't pay enough attention to the real psychological thoughts of men and their lives. Now, why was Bloch, why did Bloch turn so much against Lukács? It was because he linked the faults in Lukács' history of class consciousness to the success of fascism. He believed that the defeat of, working, of the working class in the 20s was linked to the defects of socialist and communist theory. And that vice versa, these reasons for the defeat of the working class and the defects of Marxist, of Marxist theory were equally the reasons for the success of fascism. Now, how did Bloch explain this or make this link? Well, it depended on a reinterpretation of the classic Marxist theory of social change. The classic Marxist theory of social change is that social change occurs when new forces of production come into contradiction with old existing relations of production. 
contradiction then develops in two senses. There's a contradiction between the old ruling class and the new ruling class, for example, in the transition from feudalism to capitalism, between the landowning aristocracy and the entrepreneurial bourgeoisie. And as the new social relations develop, a second contradiction appears between the bourgeoisie and the working class. For the bourgeoisie's existence is based on the appropriation of private profit, while the working class's <coughs> existence is based on socialized labor. Now this contradiction, which is a classic one, the contradiction, the developing contradiction between the bourgeoisie and the working class, Bloch called a contemporaneous contradiction. Contemporaneous, that is the fundamental basic contradiction of capitalism. He called it contemporaneous. I'm afraid it's a dreadful word, but that's the best translation of it I can think of. But Bloch emphasized that the capitalist mode of production also inherits contradictions from other earlier modes of production, which not, do not merely survive within the new mode of production, but are actually reproduced by it. This, in fact, is the theory of uneven development. It's what Marx called the un a theory of uneven development of capitalism. This theory states that the development of capitalism depends on pockets of pre-capitalist activity which can be destroyed, incorporated, or perpetuated depending on the needs of a dominant capitalist system. Bloch called this secondary network of contradictions non-contemporaneous contradictions. So Bloch makes a distinction between two kinds of contradictions between social classes in advanced capitalist society. The fundamental contradiction which Marx pointed to between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, which he called a contemporaneous contradiction, and other contradictions between the dominant capitalist classes and those classes which had survived from other modes of production, not only really survived, but whose existence were perpetuated by capitalism. Now he called this non-contemporaneous because they were classes inherited, as it were, or reproduced from an earlier period, and he called it a contradiction because he believed that these classes would also be in revolt against capitalist society. They were also potentially revolutionary classes, but the potential revolutionary force would usually be reactionary. Now, what were these groups or classes? Bloch was interested in three, particularly. The first one is the young, or youth, young people. And he thought that this group, although they were likely to be opposed to the existing society, were potentially the most progressive group. For they exist with a sense of the incompletion of their society. They are filled with dreams and they take their strength from a possible future. They tend to be utopian. But the other two classes tend to be reactionary. The first of these was the peasantry, a class inherited from a previous mode of production but reproduced, obviously, within the capitalist system. And this was particularly true of Germany, where capitalist social relations tend, had tended not to penetrate the countryside. The peasantry still possessed the means of production and lived a fairly stable communal existence, unlike capitalist classes. However, they tend to be anti-capitalist and politically regressive. The third group, of the th third class, was divided into two. First of all, oh, the class of the petty bourgeoisie, but divided into the old petty bourgeoisie and the new petty bourgeoisie. The old petty bourgeoisie, that is those who are self-employed, had become impoverished. And for this reason, they intended to be opposed to um, advanced capitalist society. The new petty bourgeoisie were salaried workers and bureaucrats, people who were not direct producers like the proletariat, but whose conditions of work had often been proletarianized. I'm sorry for that word. Um, and these two groups of the petty bourgeoisie, Bloch also thought would be potentially anti-capitalist. He said that they develop what he called an illogical space in which wishes and romanticisms, primal drives and mysticisms come onto the stage. So these are the three groups that he thought inherited from previous modes of production which would yet be in revolt against capitalist society.
and he thought it was very important to analyse the subjective aspects of their political experience. And he drew on Nietzsche to do this. He drew on Nietzsche's distinction between Apollo and Dionysus in his rephrasing of Lukács' theory of reification. Um, I'm mentioning this because, of course, Nietzsche is one of the NEM um, uh, authors, and Bloch was, in fact, very interested in using Nietzsche um, to analyze um, subject, subjective experience. He called Apollo what Bloch called, uh, sorry, what Lukács called reification, that is, the cold, unfeeling rationality of a society, of a rarefied society, in which people cannot understand what's going on, but against which they revolt. The principle of Dionysus he used to stress the emotional or subjective side of people's experience, as expressed in dreams, fantasies, and ideology. He brought this side of people's lives in a society in which the social process was basically incomprehensible to them, would be susceptible to illusions and ideologies, even those which were against their own interests. But he didn't just have a negative view of this susceptibility to ideology and illusion. He thought that the acceptance of such illusions would be the expression, would all, he always saw it as the expression of a human potential which nourishes itself with illusion only insofar as it cannot find expression in reality. So he had a very positive interpretation of illusions and ideologies. Bloch <coughs> considered the 20th century um, had special possibilities for revolutionary change due to the eclipse of religion. Because the turn away from otherworldly salvations to social existence had returned to men the unfilled potentialities of the present. For utopia, or unfulfilled possibilities for Bloch, is located in concrete existence, in everyday objects, in bohemian life, in expressionism or modernism, in art and in music. Utopia for Bloch is, as it were, a cultural surplus in the world, but not of it. Now, the crucial thing, he linked this up with the success of fascism. He believed that it was the fascists and not the left who had given political form to modern utopian substance, to this cultural surplus, if you like. And in doing so, the fascism or Nazism had depoliticized the substance. And I'll elaborate this. Bloch was one of the only Marxists who took seriously the power of fascism as a cultural synthesis, as a positive cultural synthesis. It was those groups which I've already mentioned, the young, the peasantry, and the petty bourgeoisie, with their specific political grievances that fascism had appealed to. Fascism, unlike the left, had been able to appeal especially to the regressive and repressed forms in which the grievances of these groups expressed themselves. Bloch accused the left of having, um, of having ignored these groups as merely reactionary. Instead, she argued, that a successful proletarian revolution, while it must be based on the fundamental contemporaneous contradiction, can only ignore what he called the non-contemporaneous contradictions at its peril. It must instead enlist the previous contradictions it must animate and awaken their critical and utopian potential. It must change their particular political resentment and regressions into what is potentially progressive and universal in the struggle of the proletariat. It should dis detach these classes from their dreams and images of a better past to images of a better future. And Bloch called this multi-level dialectics. That's, of course, a uh, polemical criticism of Lukács, whose dialectics he considered to be unilinear and um, monolithic. 
So, these were all the things which he thought that the left had failed to do. And instead, fascism had stepped in and had attained a monopoly of appeal to the mystical and romantic anti-capitalism of these three classes. It had channeled the nearly archaic and irrational aspects of their experience. While the left had neglected what Bloch wanted to call revolutionary fantasy, the left had seen fascist ideology as a new form of deception instead of decoding it as a form of wish fulfillment. Fascism, according to Bloch, and by fascism, of course, this would cover any reactionary political movement or ideology, represents a distorted and inverted hope, what he called a swindle of fulfillment. Well, it was these views on the relationship between political experience and imagery which structures Bloch's dispute with Lukacs over expressionism. And you remember, remember last week I discussed um, Lukacs' criticism of expressionism and prolet cult and showed you how ultimately, uh, in the words he wrote in 1956 at the meaning of contemporary realism, Lukacs had lumped together all many different forms of, of um, of modernism into one thing which he called modernism and which he contrasted with realism and we looked in very general terms at what was his criticism of modernist works of art. Well now I'm going to be a bit more specific this time and tell you what were Lukacs' specific arguments against expressionism. But it was these arguments against expressionism which um, lay behind the more general views against modernism um, which we discussed last week, so this is all really the same position. Although Lukacs at this point isn't considering prolet cult as much as we discussed last week. Somebody actually came in up to me at the end of last week's lecture and asked exactly what Lukacs did say about the relationship between fascism and expressionism, and it was quite true that I didn't get into it, although I did um, mention that Lukacs equated the two. So this, this week I'll make good that and try and say, show you how he did link the two. Lukacs and the other members of the German Communist Party went to Moscow when he did, associated fascism with all forms of irrationalism in bourgeois culture. They saw fascist ideology as expression of the decline and decadence of bourgeois culture. They considered that expressionist art was a symptom of the same decline and expressionism. Instead of combating that decline, expressionist art had concluded in it. Lukacs refused to see expressionism as itself a form of criticism of bourgeois society, as progressive or revolutionary in any sense at all. He thought that expressionist distortion, that is distortion in expressionist works of art, was merely a mere image of a distorted society, rather than as an attempt to understand and analyze social reality, as an attempt it tried to shock people out of their usual perceptions of that reality. He simply equated, Lukács simply equated the decline of society with the decline of art, which he saw as homogenous and linear. Dissolution in art, for Lukács, has no positive potential at all, no utopian aspects. He thought that the representation of dissolution in art was a false solution, pacifist and escapist. Instead, Lukács believed that art, by which he understood classical and realist art, should develop a mediated knowledge of the totality. That is, it should not be based on the presentation of immediate experience. should attempt to understand that immediate experience by relating it to an understanding of the whole society. Expressionist art, on the contrary, he believed, was solipsistic and idiosyncratic, a revolt of the petty bourgeoisie, which obscures social reality instead of illuminating it by merely reproducing its surface features and not relating those surface features to the larger underlying processes. Lukács accused Bloch of contributing to all these ills, of doing as a theorist 
exactly what expressionists were doing in art, which of course, as I've said, is what Bloch was self-consciously trying to do. Well, Bloch opposed Lukács on all these issues. Um, and now, when I, I use the word mo- expressionism, you should take it as well as meaning modernism. Expressionism for Bloch was the search for new artistic forms to represent new forms of experience. This art seeks out and pre- presents the revolutionary tensions and possibilities in a society. It is a more or less explicit oppositionary art. He disliked, he rejected Lukács' designation of the times as decadent. He thought that designation was static and ahistorical. It is necessary for the artist as well as the theorist always to see the contradictions and possibilities in the present. All times, said Bloch, are dialectical, that is, contradictory, transitory, and containing the future. The Lukács' view was the defeatist one. Expressionist art, noise isn't very helpful, is it? <laughs> Expressionist art tries to capture this. I think I'm going to ask you this. the contradictory and transitory elements of the present to illuminate the social possibilities. Bloch accused Lukács of despising the present and of not writing or understanding it as an artist or considering individual works of art. He pointed out that the fascists too denounced expressionism and that that was rather paradoxical that Lukács should too since he was so opposed to fascism. He believed that Lukács had denied in principle the possibility of any genuine artistic innovation of any avant-garde in late capitalist society. He showed, well, he uh, got his own back on Lukács by showing how Lukács idealized classical art, how Lukács refused to analyze its class contradic- its, sorry, its class connections that one might argue that the art which Lukács idealized, that is the realist art of the early bourgeois period, could also be shown to be passive and escapist. In fact, Lukács is glorifying early bourgeois art because he saw it as the art of a not yet disintegrated society. Lukács, in short, assumes a closed and integrated totality. He does not see that expressionism has tried to challenge that totality. To sum up their um, differences, Lukács is in fact assuming con- continuity in history, whereas Bloch assumes discontinuity. What Lukács sees as collusion with decadence, Bloch was able to see as art taking over an active, the active and positive elements in society. Even if it's true that the modern society was in decay, Bloch would say that growth comes from decay. Lukács also was wrong to deny that expressionist art had any links with the past. In fact, expressionist poets and artists were very conscious of their link with previous periods of critical art. Bloch, in fact, claimed that expressionist art was a breakthrough to popular art because it appealed to the potentially revolutionary emotions, to the subjective side of people's experience. Whereas Lukács' ideal of art was abstract and rejected anything which could not be simply labelled proletarian or bourgeois realism. Of course, Bloch was delighted that Lukács accused him of doing in his theory what he was doing in his art, because that's what Bloch believed one had to do. Well, in conclusion, I would just like to ask, who is right? We have two conflicting positions here on a whole range of issues. 
um, concerning the relationship between art and society. Admittedly, it's a specific point in time, but as I've tried to bring out in the last few lectures, these debates over expressionism and fascism still structure the debates over the relationship between modernist art and society that we're interested in today. Well, believe it or not, after all this, I think that both Lukács and Bloch are wrong. <laughs> And paradoxically, I think they're wrong for the same reasons. And uh, I, there are three ways in which I think this is true. <coughs> if you think about it, Bloch is developing his arguments from the point of view of the artist, of, a co of composition or production of works of art. Whereas Lukács is considering expressionist or modernist art from the point of view of the reception of works of art of their effect or social function. Bloch makes the assumption, it seems to me, that art is always received as it's intended, whereas Lukács makes the assumption that art is always intended as it, is, as it, was, yes, as it has been received. Now, considering that both of them were so interested in rarefication, that is the extension of commodity relations to other areas of life, it seems to me they both overlooked something. They overlooked the fact that in a society in which art is transformed into commodities, it's quite possible for intervening processes to come in between the production and reception of works of art and to distort their original significance. If we take this into account, then it could be that Bloch is right to the extent that his position represents how art, especially of modernist art, hopes to relate to society, whereas Lukács could be... ...that they both exaggerated one view, because neither of them considered that in a society in which works of art become commodities, it's impossible just to consider works of art according to either the artistic intention or how they are in fact received. There may be a contradiction between the process of um, composing a work of art and its social reception. And if you find that idea a bit strange, I'll be talking about that more when I come on to talk about Adorno. The second sense in which they both share assumptions, and I, in which I think these assumptions are very dubious, is that Bloch says, and it is an attractive position, that art can and should and must draw on and appeal to, not only art, but political movements as well, the emotional and the irrational. Otherwise, it will lose these aspects of human experience to the enemy. Lukács hated Bloch's position. He thought it was a dangerous and false emphasis. But it was an appeal to the irrational aspects. Um, of thought and of experience. <coughs> now it seems to me that on this issue they were both wrong. Bloch was wrong to see the emotional or the irrational as universal and fundamental. In fact, what counts as emotional or subjective in a society is produced and reproduced by the social structure. Whereas Lukács was wrong because he had far too rigid a definition of what will count as realistic or rational at any point in time. So he was wrong for the same reason, for he saw what is realistic or what is rational as universal, pre-given and fixed. Finally, it seems they were both wrong in another assumption which they accepted, and that was the idea that between um, 1918 and 1950, bourgeois culture was in dissolution or disintegration. <coughs> Sorry? Between when? Oh, it doesn't really matter. 1918, 1950. I'm just, just a period of the two of them. Um, Lukács, as you know, saw this as a period heralding the end of culture. Bloch what wasn't quite so uh, pessimistic, but he certainly saw this period of dissolution as a period of transition. Neither of them considered that in fact, it might be a period in which bourgeois society or late capitalist society was consolidating itself, consolidating, consolidating new modes of domination. That it wasn't a period of dissolution at all. <coughs> 
And in fact, this was a conclusion of the rest of the Frankfurt School. And they too, like Bloch, though based this conclusion on the notion of discontinuity in history. So both Bloch and Lukacs, it seemed to me, in the third instance were wrong in assuming that that period was a period of dissolution or decadence or decay or all these other words they used to describe it. And the later Frankfurt School, especially in this book by the Dialectic of Enlightenment, pointed out how, in fact, um, the, the importance of this period was the development of new forms of cultural and political domination. Nevertheless, I think if I had to choose, although don't quote me on it, I would take Bloch's view of history and art as the more open-minded and flexible, as the more likely to produce an effective and non-authoritarian cultural politics. Well, next week I'll be talking about Walter Benjamin. <laughs>